Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the Tiger Without Nine Lives? Here we are. Enjoy! Captain Herbert must have known, even as he steered for shore and they could relax at the prospect of familiar land, that he was going to have to face a court-martial. It was an inevitable fate for anyone who lost one of the king's ships, and worse yet, he had lost it because he had left his station and went in search of better prey further afield. A court-martial was the only thing that could face him, but it still had to be better than being cast away on the dry tortugas as their food ran out, which was the fate that he and his men had just escaped. If Captain Herbert was going to face a court-martial, though, he was determined to bring several of his men into it with him. He immediately wrote a letter to the vice admiral condemning the actions of three of the lieutenants. Things had been far from smooth sailing since the HMS Tiger had set out on her final voyage. The HMS Tiger was far from a young ship by the time that Captain Herbert became the captain of her. She had originally been built almost a hundred years before, in 1647, and though she had gone through three total refits and rebuilds since then, she was still getting on in years. Her last rebuild had been in 1722, and in the harsh tropics that could only make a ship seem much older than she was. At 700 tons, and with only 50 cannons, she was also hardly one of the huge ships of the line that could easily go toe-to-toe with an enemy. Captain Herbert was an ambitious man, however, and he intended to see what she could do. It seemed clear after a few weeks, the station that HMS Tiger had been given along the coast of Cuba was not going to give him the glorious prizes that Captain Herbert had dreamed of. He had been ordered to stop any Spanish ships and capture them, but there were none to be found. The War of Jenkins' Ear was ongoing and was morphing into the much larger War of Austrian Succession. The Caribbean was a perfect place, in theory, to find a Spanish convoy that would bring glory and riches to a captain for the rest of his life. All that Captain Herbert had been able to find, though, was three small periaguas small boats that would bring no one any glory to take prisoner. Captain Herbert decided to bring them with him, with the thought that they might prove useful. It was someone on one of these captured periaguas that provided the information that would tempt Captain Herbert to his downfall. He mentioned when questioned that there was supposed to be a convoy of Spanish ships that were supposed to be heading to Veracruz out of Havana. If Captain Herbert hurried, he might be able to catch them. For Captain Herbert, this was a great temptation. The men of the Navy all received prize money from the capture of any ships, with the captain getting the largest share. Captain Herbert would not be the first captain to view this money as an important supplement to his income. He resisted temptation for a few days, and then gave the order they were to head to the Gulf of Mexico before the ships were impossible to catch. It meant leaving his post, but the Navy tended to look kindly on such things, so long as the captain was successful in making a large capture. His men were not likely to object either. They all also counted on prize money and would get their share. As they came closer to Florida, the HMS Tiger came across a small English privateer that had been recently captured by the Spanish. Though the crew of the ship had eventually retaken the ship from the Spanish prize crew, the stores of the ship were now very low. They asked if the HMS Tiger would be able to share some of theirs. Captain Herbert agreed. While the two captains talked, Captain Herbert was surprised to hear the other captain comment that they were close to the Bahamas. He had thought that they were within sight of the dry tortugas, and his men had agreed. The privateer captain seemed more experienced than he was, however, and also seemed very certain of where they were. Captain Herbert immediately threw out his previous thought about where they were, and determined that they were indeed on the coast of the Bahamas. Having separated from the privateer, Captain Herbert plotted his course accordingly. The HMS Tiger would never take that route, however. 
At some point that day, the tiger would grind into the land near Garden Key, a 14-acre island and the largest island in the Dry Tortugas. At first, it seemed as though they would be able to take the ship off safely, but as the day wore on and turned into night, it became clear that every wave was driving her further and further into the shore, and water began to rush in. It didn't matter how hard they pumped, the ship was clearly never going to float again. After almost a hundred years of service, the HMS Tiger had finally made her last voyage. The crew of the HMS Tiger were fortunate. They were not lacking in small boats. They had the three periaguas, a ship's longboat, a small yawl, and a canoe, all of which were quickly put into service to ferry men and supplies from the wreck to the shore of Garden Key. Once all the supplies that were not underwater had been brought to shore, they turned their attention to defense. Florida was a Spanish territory, and with England at war with Spain, they were now stranded on enemy land. Twenty cannons were moved from the wreck to the shore, and a battery was constructed. Both the yawl and the longboat were sent out to go look for help, but as time stretched on, Captain Herbert began to think of the possibility that something had happened to both small boats, and he ordered that modifications start to be made to some of the smaller ones so that they could make a long voyage if needed. Meanwhile, Captain Herbert ordered that rations be cut in half so that the food would last longer since they did not know how long they would be trapped on the island. The yawl was not out for long, only a few days, and it came back with important news. The captain's original thought on where they were was correct. They were in the Keys of Florida. This cannot have been entirely welcome news. Not only did it mean that they were trapped in Spanish-controlled Florida, a nation they were at war with, but it also meant that the longship had left in a direction that would not do them any good. They were clearly going to need a new plan. Before they could decide what to do next, their worst fears were realized. The sail of a Spanish ship was spotted, and Lieutenant Dennis, who was working nearby, immediately prepared for an attack. He need not have worried. The Spanish ship was not at all interested in his small band of castaways. They were instead set on salvaging the main mast and top masts for their own uses. As soon as the Spanish ship had finished replacing their mast with the mast of the HMS Tiger, they sailed away. Though the incident had been uneventful, it proved that the Spanish now knew of them and their position of vulnerability, something none of them were pleased with. It also left a bad taste in everyone's mouth to have the Spanish now provisioning themselves from their wrecked ship. A few days later, Lieutenant Dennis was again working near the wreck when a new Spanish ship appeared and sent a small boat towards the wreck. Determined that the enemy was not going to gain anything further from their misfortune, Lieutenant Dennis set fire to the wreck. Soon, the wrecked HMS Tiger, which had survived for so long in the British service, was burned to the waterline. The Spanish did send a boat out to speak with the castaways, but Captain Herbert refused all of their aid. They did tell him that the crew of the missing longboat had been captured by them, and was already in prison in Havana. Hardly welcome news. Though Captain Herbert might have been comforted that most of them were still alive, at least. The Spanish ship left without incident after speaking with them for a little while, perhaps deciding that they were not worth the trouble. A barge that had been sent out with Lieutenant Scott in charge returned with an unexpected prize. They had found a sloop that had been apparently abandoned by the Spanish after a battle due to extensive damage. They had put some care into it, and they were able to limp it back to where the tiger had been wrecked. It was not in good condition, but it was the closest thing to a lifeline that they now had. If the men thought things would be more relaxed now that they had a ship again, they were to be disappointed, and the lack of provisions mixed with the hard labor was starting to put the crew in a dangerous mood. Some of the men approached Lieutenant Scott with their complaints, and he agreed to speak with the captain on their behalf. Perhaps the meeting would have gone better if Lieutenant Scott had gone alone, but many of the sailors and marines came with him as moral support, a mob that Captain Herbert rightly saw as potentially mutinous and definitely insubordinate. 
He allowed Lieutenant Scott to read their complaints and then immediately had him arrested as the leader of the mob. To the rest, he reiterated that his authority was final and he had the power to have executed anyone who failed to recognize it in the future. With this, everyone returned to work. There was a lot of work to be done before any of the vessels in their possession were fit to go to the sea. While they were still working on this task, the Spanish ship that they had spoken with returned. The men of the HMS Tiger could not help but eye the Spanish vessel as a chance to gain their freedom from the island faster. As many men as would fit were crammed into small boats, and they rowed out to the Spanish ship in the middle of the night. The attack was almost immediately a disaster. The Spanish lookout saw them and called out before they were ready, and under the gunfire, the men in Lieutenant Dennis's boat lost all of their nerve, and while the men of the other boats scrambled up, they started throwing grenades and shooting wildly. One of their grenades hit the barge, sinking it, while some of their own men were injured by the shots of the men in Lieutenant Dennis's boat. One of the men hit was Lieutenant Farish, who had gained the deck only to be hit by a bullet from his own side and being forced to retreat back to the barge he had been in command of. The smallest of the boats were able to pull the barge crew out of the water, but morale was low. They made a boarding attempt again, but this time Lieutenant Craig was wounded, and they once again retreated to their boats. The Spanish ship, free of her attackers, sailed away from them, while they returned defeated to their island. Despite the setback of their military defeat, they were soon able to leave the island anyway. They had the sloop that they had repaired, a periagua that they had rigged as a schooner, and the three remaining small boats. Every one of them was overloaded, and at this point they were running dangerously low on provisions, but they were finally able to leave the Keys and head back towards Jamaica. The sloop towed the small boats, which were not able to keep up, and eventually it was decided that the schooner and the sloop would also split up. They had intended to meet up later, but as the schooner took longer to arrive than thought, and with their food running out, Captain Herbert made his way to Port Royal, with the small boats still in tow. The schooner did eventually reach Port Royal as well, meaning that despite it having been four months since the shipwreck, somehow Captain Herbert had managed to keep all but five of his men alive and returned to English-controlled soil. This did not seem to put Captain Herbert in a generous mood, however. He immediately charged Lieutenant Scott with the attempted mutiny and charged that Lieutenant Dennis and Lieutenant Craig had failed in their duty to take the Spanish ship. The four men were eventually tried together at a single court-martial. What was found was that Lieutenants Craig and Dennis had done everything in their power to take the Spanish ship. Things had just conspired against them. The men that had been in Lieutenant Dennis's boat had been the worst of the crew left to him by Lieutenant Farish, who had taken all the best men for himself. Lieutenant Craig also could not be blamed for not pressing the attack. The surgeon of the ship testified that he had indeed been seriously wounded in the attack. They were acquitted. As for Lieutenant Scott, the court viewed all the facts and came to the conclusion that, rather than mutinous intent, he was just too young and inexperienced to have known any better. They sentenced him to be severely reprimanded for his conduct but it was a much better fate than a charge of mutiny would have carried. The last was Captain Herbert. He was charged with ignoring his orders by leaving the station he had been assigned in the first place, and of not being prudent by not preparing an anchor when they had first noted shallow water. These were two very serious charges, but the court was also forced to admit that he had led his crew back to safety despite all of the many dangers. In recognition of this, while he was sentenced to lose all of his back pay from the last 20 months, he was recommended to continue serving as a captain of the British Navy. He had somehow managed to survive what normally would have been a career-ending event through his ability to plan ahead and accurately assess the situation that he was in. He was duly appointed a command over another ship shortly after. As for the Tiger, there would be more HMS Tigers in the future. 
Few of them had as long lives as the one that died on the shores of Florida, however. Where she met her end is now part of the American National Park Service, overlooked by the historic Fort Jefferson. For more information on this wreck, please see The Florida Keys, Volume 1, by John Vialli, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.